Good morning, Heritage Bible Church. Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand with us as we begin to worship? I'm going to read Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Jesus. 
Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. Your faithful, faithful in all things. In every high, in every low, on mountain tops, down from.
Good morning, Heritage Bible Church. Um, want to transition us into a time of, of offering. You can be, be seated for just a moment as we transition into a, another act of worship in which we, we give of the gifts and of the blessings that we realize that God has given us. We give out of the, the generosity and the abundance that we have found in the spirit, the freedom that we have found in Christ. Uh, and we also come and acknowledge that we live in a, in a broken world that is hurting and currently at conflict. And so let me uh, share just a few words out of Micah chapter 4 and then offer to pray for us. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. And it will be raised above the hills and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we can walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many people and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. Let's pray today for our conflict and for our offering as we give back to the Lord. Father, we come in and we acknowledge that the world is, is hurting and broken. It is marred by sin. Uh, it is broken, God, and, and as we read the news and the headlines and see the stories and pictures of, of a world in conflict, of a world that in, involved in strife, in war, um, God, and in death, we realize that we are powerless to save ourselves. And so we call on you as our Savior, God, to heal, to mend, to restore, God, uh, that in this time, uh, God, we pray for your peace to reign uh, around the world, God, but also here with us in the ways we experience and, and maybe bring into this sanctuary our own hurts and our own brokenness and our own conflicts, God, would you heal and restore and extend grace to us. And as we turn and acknowledge that, God, we realize the many ways in which you have already saved us and are continuing to save us, God, and through your faithfulness will continue to save. And so our offering is an act of generosity. It is an act of service, God, a recognition of the ways in which you are working in us and through us, God. And so we as your people, God, we give generously uh, of our offerings, but also of our time, of our thoughts. Uh, of our willingness to, to know you, to seek you, to find you, God, and to proclaim you here and among the nations. Help us through this time to be those people and to extend that grace and that good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand. 
I have needed you, that we have needed you this week, and that what you really want is for us to need you and to want you and to be with you and to commune with you throughout the week. And we want you to be glorified in what we do and what we say so that we can be the Christ light to other people around us, God. And we sing this because we want you and we sing this because we need you. Not a little, Lord, but for everything, for our very breath, Lord, we, we, we put what we have down here on the altar, Lord, and take what we have and just help us to commit to you fully with no reservations and give all of our burdens and our fears and the things that just so easily entangle us and help us to throw it off. And Lord, we, we thank you that you want to love us, that you created us in your image to, to, to be loved by you. And that we are fully, we are made full when we embrace that love, Jesus. God, I pray for the message that Victoria is going to give the kids today as they go to Children's Church. And God, I pray that you would really have your spirit move in that room. And I know it, it, shakes, uh, it shakes the teachers, it shakes everyone there when your spirit is there, Lord. And we pray that you would do something miraculous for them and for their families. God, may your name be lifted up and praised forevermore. Amen. Hey, we have some beautiful people here, some little people. So if you consider yourself a child and are a child, um, would you <laughs> make your way to the middle aisle and go with Miss Victoria? And as they find their way out, would you please turn around and greet those around you?
Let me encourage you to go ahead and find a seat as we continue our worship. Let me just share a few brief announcements before we jump into the, the message. Uh, first of all, let me give you an update. We had a yard sale yesterday uh, that uh, ended up very productive, and I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who donated, uh, gave items, uh, clear up until uh, Friday afternoon, uh, people pulling up with a U-Haul truck to unload, and that, that was great. Uh, also want to thank uh, all the volunteers. We had twice as many volunteers this year as last year, uh, which made things uh, much easier and allowed uh, people to, we had a, a group of people volunteered Friday afternoon to help sort items. There were other people that showed up early in the morning Saturday to open up, to uh, put stuff out, and then volunteers who helped sell during the morning. Uh, that turned out great. Uh, I wanted to tell you, last year, after expenses, we, the yard sale netted a profit of $175. Um, and most of that but most of what we earned had to go to pay for a banner that, that we had put up. This year, since the banner was paid for, we netted a profit of $425. And so we're grateful for that. We'll use, we'll use that for different ministries. Uh, you know, and at, a, at a yard sale at 9.30, you, know, you have a half hour left, and you just announce to everybody, hey, everything's a dollar or two, take your pick. Then at 10 o'clock, you announce everything's free. Just, just so you don't have to haul it away. And a, and a couple of guys at 10 o'clock grabbed stuff, took it out to the, the front parking lot in front of the banner, and we had put a sign up and said free, put a number of items out there. They were all gone within a couple hours. Um, so that made things uh, really good. And so it was just a lot of fun. We also passed out little uh, uh, copies of Gospel of John with a flyer for the fall festival in it, invited people to come. The school, I don't know if you realize this or not, the school, was, through a grant, was able to receive all new desks and chairs and tables. So what do you do with all the old desks and chairs and tables? We gave those away for free to school families. We publicized that yesterday to people that came to the yard sale. Uh, so a lot of those were taken away, and so we're really grateful for that. Uh, in your bulletin, let me just point out, there's a connection card. If you have prayer requests, fill that out on the back, or if you want to volunteer or be part of a group, you can check that off. If you're a first-time guest, fill this out. Uh, we will collect all these cards at the end of the service, but if you're a first-time guest, hang on to it, take it to the information center, and we have a gift for you. So I want to give that to you. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll notice an insert about Christmas in October. Uh, and Christmas is in October is a chance uh, for us to, to give a special offering above our regular offering that goes to our missionaries. And so there are different envelopes, uh, such as this one. This is, this is my Christmas in October offering that I'm giving. Uh, there were, there's envelopes of, of different style and different colors. We encourage you to give a gift to our missionaries. We collect it in October now so that we can send it to them so that by December they can get the money and, and use it to, for Christmas gifts in their own family. So we encourage you to, to give that way. Also in your bulletin, there's an insert about our fall festival, which is happening Sunday, October 29th from 4 to 6. And if... Uh, we, we need some help. If, if you can volunteer uh, or if you can give candy or if you want to be involved with the trunk or treat, we're doing a little different format this year. We'll still have pop-ups and we'll have the train and we'll have a bounce house. But we're doing 15 or 20 cars, a trunk or treat out in the, the middle school lawn area. And so if you want to participate in that, just let us know on your connection card that you want to participate in that. Uh, so we look forward. And there's big bins in the social hall where you can give and, and donate candy. Uh, I was at Smart and Final. They've got candy on sale. So I brought about five bags and uh, brought those back here. And one last announcement real quick. I forgot to put in the bulletin, uh, just wanting to remind men of our monthly men's breakfast, which is Saturday, October 28th, the day before our fall festival. Uh, and that'll be 8 o'clock uh, in the social hall that Saturday morning, homemade breakfast. We started a new series on Comeback Boys of the Bible. This month, we're looking at the life of Joseph. Uh, 
And each month we look at a man who faced challenges or failures or setbacks, and God raised them up and brought them back. And if there's anybody who suffered a tremendous setback and challenge, it would be Joseph, sold as a slave, falsely accused, thrown in jail, in jail for 10 or 15 years, and then God finally freed him and uh, raised him up to be a uh, leader in the land of Egypt, saving the people of, of God from death and and famine. So, uh, so men, join us for that. That's a great time. It's a great video series, and uh, look forward to having you join us. Sign on your card if you're planning on it, on coming, so we know how many uh, how much food to prepare. And I think Ashley and Pat are preparing this month's uh, breakfast. Well, we're continuing a new series in the book of First uh, Peter called Hope in the Midst of Hard Times. First Peter was a, a letter that was written to Christians who were suffering and going through trials. And our message today is entitled, Following God Without Giving Satan a Foothold. There is a sermon outline in your bulletin. If you want to pull that out, follow along, take notes. There's discussion questions on the back if you want to uh, discuss those uh, with friends or family. Last Last weekend, Annette and I were in Lodi for a school of prayer ministry with VMTC. Some of you may know that VMTC stands for Victorious Ministry Through Christ. You may remember that uh, leaders of VMTC were the people that led our prayer seminar here at Heritage last April. Um, and this is the fifth school of prayer ministry that Annette and I have gone to. Fifth one. And so some of you may be sitting there wondering, why do you keep going back? You know, it's, it's pretty much the, the same material and same information that they are teaching, and that's true. But at the school, we learn to pray for people so that they experience victory in their Christian life. And often that involves some type of spiritual warfare. It's interesting, even though it's a Pretty much the same material that they're teaching. We have a binder and a, a workbook that we follow through. At every school, we learn something new about prayer. Or we, like for me, especially this last weekend, I gain new understanding about praying for other people. The reality is that Satan is a real being. He's not a mythical creature. He is a real being, an angel who rebelled against God, was kicked out of heaven, and his, his purpose and goal today, according to Jesus' words in John 10, is to steal, kill, and destroy your life and my life. That is his goal. We, we live our lives with a spiritual enemy who's dedicated to our destruction. And you and I have to know how to pray against that to be victorious and stand up to his temptation. In other words, he really wants unbelievers as well as Christians to be held in bondage to sin. Now see, not all sin is dealt with at the point of salvation. When we pray and put our trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, he forgives all of our sin, past, present, and future. But because you and I are born with a selfish nature, we still struggle with sin. We will struggle with sin all of our lives. Let me give you an example. Take your Bibles. Turn with me in the New Testament to the book of Ephesians. I want to start there this morning. Uh, and I want to point, these are familiar verses, but there may be something you haven't noticed or really had explained to you. Ephesians 4, right after Galatians. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 26. Paul writes and says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, I want you to notice something. Paul is writing to Christians here, and he's warning them, saying that when we sin, we allow Satan a foothold in our life. In other words, we allow Satan to impact and influence our life so that we would sin. Now, 
Having a foothold in your life is not the same as, as demon possession, but it still is an activity of, of an evil spirit in our lives. We have to be aware of that. Let me give you another example from Scripture of the, the impact of, of demonic influence and activity. Paul writes about visions that he had in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he explains that in order for him not to become conceited or become proud, God allowed what he says is, quote, a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan. God allowed that in Paul's life to, you know, um, to impact his life. And, and by God allowing that in his life, Paul ended up remaining humble and he boasted of God's power in his life. Even though three times Paul prayed that God would take that away, take this thorn in my flesh away, God chose not to. It kept him humble. He focused on God's power in his life instead of being able to rely on himself and, and his spiritual experiences. When we were at the school, we spent a lot of time praying for other people, praying for one another, sometimes having lengthy prayer sessions. And, and at the school, before we pray for someone, we pray introductory prayers. We want to make sure that all of us are prepared for what God may want to do in, in someone's life. And so we pray introductory prayers. We pray for victory. We pray for the, the exercise of, of spiritual gifts as we're praying. We pray for unity. We pray for authority over unclean spirits as well as divine protection. And once we do that, Everyone in, in that prayer session prays for confession and forgiveness. Um, and so when you think about it, and sometimes a prayer session, when, you, when you're uh, doing all that, uh, you can spend two or three hours praying uh, for someone in a time together. There's a variety of things that are going on. For example, a uh, person we're praying for will review a long list of bondages and sins. They will read through that list. They will check off those that apply in their life. And once they go through the whole list, then we have, that, have a person pray through everything that they checked off. And they confess that. And then they renounce uh, those sins in their life. And then the, the other people in that group, uh, other people will, will pray for that person. Um, and based on the Word of God, uh, if you're praying for someone... Uh, by taking the authority of God's word, we, we cut bondages in their life. We then pray if there is a pray and try to discern if there is a spirit connected with that sin. And if we sense that there is one, uh, we pray, we bind, and we cast that spirit out. Um, now, maybe you have never prayed that way for, for different people. Uh, and you may be sitting here wondering, is that something that I would ever think of doing? You know, binding and casting out spirits. Let me just tell you something. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, God has given you the authority and the right to bind and cast out evil spirits. Even if you've never done it before in your life, you have that authority based on God's word, power of Jesus' blood shed on the cross. That's what gives you authority over evil spirits. It's not your knowledge. It's not your spiritual maturity. It's not how long you've spent in church. It's the Word of God and, and the blood of Jesus that gives you that authority. It's not something to, be, to get word about, okay? Um, but let me also give a little advice and, and warning. Uh, I mean, if that's something that, that interests you or you're just curious about, then... You know, come talk to Annette or me. We'd love to share with you about that um, and also give you advice that we have learned. But also, you need wisdom here. Um, this type of ministry, uh, you need to be serious about it. It can cause more harm than good if, you're not, if, you're, if your intentions are not uh, proper and, and sincere. Uh, one example, a really bizarre story in Scripture. In Acts chapter 19, there was a group of seven brothers that had heard about Paul and knew what Paul was doing in his preaching and miracles and casting out spirits. And they were going around trying to imitate Paul. And they were trying to cast out evil spirits. 
you know, and they were, they were attempting to, to do that. And then all of a sudden, it's really strange that the, the person who they're praying for to cast out an evil spirit, the evil spirit responds to these seven brothers and confronts them and mocks them. And the evil spirit speaks to these brothers and say, I know Jesus, I know Paul, who are you? And then has those seven brothers beaten up. And they're all bloodied and they run out of the house without any clothes on. So it's not something you, you enter into, you know. They're mocked, you know, their, their motive and their, their level of spirituality uh, was less than genuine. Uh, strange story. But here's an important, really important point to remember about all of it, you know, prayer and spiritual warfare. You can pray for confession of sin in your life. You can, and you should. But if Satan has a foothold in your life, you need additional prayer. Often confession is, is not enough to deal with that, and you need other people to pray. When we're in a prayer session, one of the last things we do, we make sure the person has a, prays for a new infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that's important because Jesus said, warned us, that you know, by doing that, then you prevent any evil spirit from going and getting other spirits to come back and torment that person even worse. So we want to make sure that the person that we prayed for, that we've cast things out of and cast bondages, cleared them of, of bondages, they have the freedom to walk in victory. That only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we make sure people are filled with the Spirit and are walking in, in His power and, and His might. Um, and it was exciting. We saw people visibly change at, the, at the, this school. I remember I, I met a woman who was there for the very first time. She was there. Maybe she was a little apprehensive. She was very serious. She never smiled. And finally on the last day, I saw her as she came out of her prayer session. And we headed to lunch and she had this big grin on her face. She was smiling. She was just beaming. And I looked at her and I said, hey, you're, you're really smiling. You know, and she said, I had a great time. You know, pe people who prayed for her. You could, you could say, you could see she was a different person because of the power of prayer in that session. Um, she knew that she had been set free. And that was just exciting to see. So why do we keep going back to the school? And we hope to go back next February, too, for the sixth time. Why do we keep going back? To see people set free. To continue learning how we can pray for others that they can experience victory and, and walk in God's power. Uh, so they can experience freedom in their life. It's something we'd like to incorporate even more than we do here at, at Heritage. And as we look at 1 Peter, Peter shares some keys to walking in victory uh, in his letter. Uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter, which is near the end of the New Testament, uh, it was Hebrews and then James and then 1 Peter. Look with me, 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me read just a few verses starting verse 13. Therefore... With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. In our pursuit of holiness, where does that process begin based on this passage? Where does the process of holiness begin? It begins in our minds. Verse 13. Whatever you put into your mind goes into your heart. Whatever is in your heart is what guides your life. And Peter gives us a picture here that most of us miss. Because we don't understand either the, the terminology or the culture of, of Peter's day. 
Verse 13 says, with minds that are alert and fully sober. The Greek here for that first phrase literally means to gird the hips of your mind. And it's a call to action. In Peter's day in first century Israel, common people uh, living in Israel, common men, would wear a long sleeveless shirt that went all the way down to their knees. Okay? They would wear that under their, their clothes. And it, it would be worn for in casual settings. Okay? But if a man ever ended up going to work or was called to war, he would take that the shirt, pull it up to his waist and tuck it in, which would free his legs so that he could do the job that he was going to be assigned to, either at war or whatever work was, was going on. That's what the first phrase refers to when it says, with, my, with minds that are alert. Then it says, Peter says, with minds that are alert and fully sober. Fully sober is a metaphor for having clear, balanced judgment. So where does, where does Peter want us to focus our minds? Let me read verse 13 again. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. You and I are commanded to focus, set our hope and focus on God's grace. Now, when you look at what the Bible teaches, grace is essential for us in every stage of our Christian life. Paul says that, that we are saved by grace. That's the past. Peter writes in 2 Peter and says, to grow in grace. That's present. Paul wrote to Timothy in his last letter and said, Timothy, be strong in the grace that's been given to you in Christ Jesus. That was present. And here in 1 Peter 1, Peter says we're, that we're told to focus on the grace that's going to be given to you at the second coming of Christ. That's future. So great, we often think of grace and say, oh, we're saved by grace, and we think of that grace, that's what happens when we get saved. And that's true. But grace is involved in every part of our Christian life, our entire life, past, present, and future. Often we're told when people talk about grace, grace is, oh, grace, that's favor that we don't deserve. And that's true. That, that picture of grace is, is true. I like what one writer said. He describes grace as power to be pleasing to God. And I like that. Because you grow in grace and you're strong in grace with God's power that helps us be pleasing in God's eyes. See, when God is pleased with us, then we are motivated to live for him. We ignore desires that we used to live by when we were unbelievers. When God is pleased with us, we pursue holiness because we want to please our Heavenly Father who is holy. To be holy literally means to be set apart for a special purpose. And that's what Peter challenges us in this first chapter. And what is the motive? What is the motive for you and I to focus on the grace of God in our lives? Well, Peter explains that in the next paragraph. Look with me, starting at verse 17. He says, Since you call on a father who judges, judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. The motive, the reason we focus on God's grace is that you and I have been bought. You and I have been bought by God. God paid for us to be part of his family. And the price he paid for that was the death of his son. When Jesus was nailed to the cross and crucified. 
That's the price he paid so that we could be part of his family. The Bible calls this redemption. You and I are redeemed. The word redeem literally means to be bought back. I was, I was reading through Nehemiah this week as part of my devotions. I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, a great book about leadership. And I love being reminded of leadership principles in reading through that. Because thousands of years ago, God used Nehemiah to motivate and mobilize Jews who were living in the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the wall around the city and around the temple. Even though there was a lot of opposition from, from different uh, opposing groups of people um, from different nationalities. And so uh, Nehemiah arrived in, in Jerusalem and his goal was to inspire people uh, to do the work despite dealing with ridicule and dealing with, with false accusations, even, even dealing with uh, death threats toward him, people wanting to kill him. Uh, and while all that's going on, those out, outward threats helped unify the Jews. But there was an inward threat that threatened to, to destroy the building project that was going on. Uh, rebuilding that wall took almost two months for the Jews to complete. And Nehemiah uh, chapter 5 or 6 tells us that the project ended up taking 52 days to rebuild the wall. And during those 52 days, every day you've got Jews out there working to rebuild the wall. While they're working on the wall, they're away from work. They're away from trying to earn money, pay for bills. So while they're working on the wall, money became tight. And some Jews had to sell their fields, sell some of their possessions. Some borrowed money from other Jews. And those Jews charged them interest, which the Bible says was illegal to do. There were some parents, because money was tight, who sold their children into slavery in order to pay bills and provide food. They were going to extreme measures. When Nehemiah heard what was going on and some of the challenges that, that families were having to deal with, um, he got angry and he confronted those who were in the wrong. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Here's the easiest way to find it. If you, if you go to the middle of the Bible, you'll get close to the book of Psalms, okay? Um, if, you, if you're in Psalms, go three books back, Job, Esther, and then you end up in Nehemiah. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5, okay? Nehemiah chapter 5. Starting in verse 6, it says, <clears throat> When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. Because he's finding out about all the challenges facing Jews and money and things. Verse 7, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said. We will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. So Nehemiah has to confront fellow Jews. Let them know what they're doing is not biblical. It's not right. They're oppressing fellow Jews and taking advantage of them. When they're down, I want you to notice verse 8. He says to them, We have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. They had bought back fellow Jews. In other words, they redeemed them. 
There were Jews that were sold to Gentiles as slaves. They went and they bought them back. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, God redeemed us from our empty way of life with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus' death was the ransom that God paid for our freedom. It's interesting, when Jesus was crucified, Pilate nailed a sign to Jesus' cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he had it written in Aramaic and Greek and Latin. Do you know why? Three different languages, because there were so many Jews from other countries that had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And Pilate wanted to make an example of Jesus. Here was somebody who claimed to be king. And people who do that are committing treason, and they end up crucified. So Pilate wanted people of all different nationalities and nations and languages to know what had happened to Jesus. And it's interesting, that was the sign on his cross. One of, one of Jesus' last sayings he uttered when he hung on the cross. So he hung on the cross, and one of his last thing he said was, it is finished. They were told he gave up his spirit and died. The Greek word for that phrase, it is finished, is pronounced tetelestai. And archaeologists have found the Latin equivalent of tetelestai as they have uncovered ancient tax receipts and accountants' offices. And they've noticed that on, on receipts that have the Latin equivalent of tetelestai is a Latin phrase that says, paid. The debt is paid. Jesus' death on the cross paid our debt of sin. And that's why we put our trust in him as our, our Savior. And so when people saw Jesus hanging on the cross, they may have heard him say, to tell us die, and knew what that meant, that the debt had been paid, whether it was Greek or Latin or people who spoke Aramaic, you know. Many understood different languages. So let me ask this question as we close. What is your greatest need in your life this morning? Every one of us, whether we're a new Christian or we've walked with God for, for decades or if, if we're an unbeliever, every one of us needs God's grace in our life. Maybe you've never opened your life up to God's free gift of grace and forgiveness and salvation. You can receive that gift this morning simply through prayer. For others, if you're, since you're here, as you look at your life, your Christian life may seem a little stale and sluggish. That sometimes happens. And if that's your situation, maybe you realize you need a, you need a fresh surrender of grace in your life and a new filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, Ephesians 5 commands us, you know, to be filled with the Spirit. And the Greek of that, that command literally means to be continually filled every day. As we, surrender, as we surrender to God, that's how we are filled. That's what it really means to be filled, is that we're, we surrender every part of our life and then God fills us with his spirit. He, he takes control of our lives. That's what it means to be filled. Maybe that's what you need to pray for this morning. We're going to have a time of prayer in just a moment. Some of you may also be wondering, if you're honest, if Satan has a foothold in your life. And if that's you, then I really want to encourage you to come, come talk to me or Annette. We'd love to, to pray with you about that situation. If we need to set up an, an another time to meet so we have more time to talk through issues and, and explain issues and pray with you, we can do that as well. Let me invite worship team to come up as we prepare for our final song. And as we close, as they're coming up, what I want to do is I want to give, uh, give you a moment of, of silent prayer. I want to encourage you to, to pray about what is your greatest need in your life right now, and then I will go ahead and, and pray. 
and we'll continue. But let's just take a moment, reflect on what you've heard and what you've read in Scripture. Think about your biggest spiritual need right now. We all need God's grace. What do you need God's grace to do in your life this morning? Let's pray. Father, we realize that every one of us needs your grace in our life. Your word tells us that we're saved by grace. We can grow in it. We can be strong in your grace. And we can look forward to grace that you plan on pouring out on each of us when you return. God, I pray for every person here, and whatever their need is to experience your grace, may you meet them at their point of need. And may grace be the power so that that transforms our lives, that we are pleasing in your sight and honoring to you. I pray that our lives would, would honor and glorify you and lift up the name of Jesus. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand for a final song, and as you do, go ahead and pass your connection cards to the center aisle if you've filled any of those out. If you're a guest, first-time guest, take your card to the information booth after, and we'll have a gift. Let's sing together a final song.
going to recite together as our benediction, 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. Let's begin. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Walk in his grace and peace. You're dismissed.